I am so delighted to be talking to uh, Richard Rick Boothby uh, on the occasion of the publication of his uh, long awaited memoir, Blown Away. And I want to get into that memoir a little bit with him today and let him talk about the background to it and things that uh, make it, especially to my mind, one of the most distinctive works of creative nonfiction that I've ever read. So I will just start with with that question, what is it that made you feel like you had to write it in, 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 in such a in, in response to such a horrific event? And then, what do you think makes it distinctive? Because there are clearly are a lot of memoirs written about grief and about how we respond to tragedy. What? Did, how did you? So, what? First of all, what made you write it? And then, what? It, how did you? How do you think it's? What made it? Dis, what makes it distinct in your mind? Uh, that's a good place to start. Um, sort of start at the beginning, as it were. Um, I mean, the first thing to say about this book, I think, is that it, by the very nature of the beast, it's intensely personal. Um, it's not a how-to book about how to survive grief. It's not a book about addiction or about suicide or um, it or about any kind of you know societal trends and the rest of it. You could take it in those directions, but this is not what I'm up to. It, it's a very, very in-depth and intensive personal log of experience. And when I started writing it, my son, um, I lost him to his suicide uh, in response on his part to a very intractable drug addiction, um, culminating in, in the last years of his life with, with a heroin addiction. And he, he died in 2006. So it's now, um, um, you know, 16 years ago. Um, and I started it only a year after he died uh, and started it really not as writing for someone else, but just writing for myself. I was really compelled. I felt like I had to sort of come to terms with his loss in some way. And I really didn't know how to do it. So it was a, it was a real survival issue. Um, at the same time, I started writing notes and drafts for various kind of texts, you know, that they were really for me. Uh, and I also started around the same time seeing a, a psychoanalyst uh, at first face-to-face, uh, -face, you know, once a week, and then quite intensively for a few years, um, you know, in the kind of classic mode, face to, you know, uh, on, the, on the couch and four times a week and stuff. So, um, so Rick, the, the analysis that you recount at that length in the book is basically coincides with the writing of the book. That's interesting. So, Yes, that's, yeah. that's right. Actually, I started to a year or two after his death. Uh, I, I made a first attempt a year afterwards. Um, matter of fact, um, I think we were together for this a trip to Cyprus where we were um, um, at a convention and I started trying to write some stuff there, but I just couldn't, uh, it didn't work. And um, um, maybe about two years later, I started, but yes, I made a huge diary of the the analysis um, and a lot of what ended up in the memoir was in that or taken from that diary. Um, and yeah, at the beginning, it was just me trying to find my own way with the worst thing that had ever happened to me. Well, it's interesting to me that your, I think, I think this is true, right? That your first psychoanalysis with Mustafa Safwan was actually interrupted by Oliver, right? So is it, am I right about that? That's exactly correct. Yeah, I was in 2003. I was in living in France for the semester on, on, sabbat, on a sabbatical, and yes, I was I was in an analysis with with Mustafa Safwan, and um, and I had to cut it short by about a month my stay in France because Oliver made his first attempt at suicide, a kind of more theatrical attempt, really than anything else. But yes, that's exactly correct, and it's also a little bit of a, it ends up the the, the 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 memoir is somewhat artful in the sense that some of the material that I present in a in just a what I depict in the memoir is a, a sort of I don't know eight or ten sessions with an analyst some of the material was actually from that oh. that period before Oliver's death altogether but it all became deeply relevant really painfully relevant um, but yes you're exactly correct and then, and then 
So in what sense did you, because you did make a decision at some point to publish it, right? I mean, that must have been a, a, a in some ways, a wrenching decision, right? Because you're, you're exposing yourself to the world in a, like something that's very intensely personal. And then what, what made you think that this is something different from other books about grieving? I mean, did you, or, or memoirs about grieving, or did you th not think it was, you just thought, I just like publishing it will just is important to me because I feel like this is a story I want to share with people. And maybe that was it. Or did you feel like, Oh no, there's something specific about this and distinctive about this that I think uh, would, would, be helpful to other people in a way that other memoirs haven't been? Well, that, yeah, I think what happened was, a, 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 first of all, a very, very slow passage. It took years. Um, I wrote this initial draft, um, I think it was maybe the summer of 2008. I wrote this initial draft in a kind of mania. You know, I, I, I had returned briefly to compulsive smoking, sitting out on the porch of the house I was living in at the time. Um, working on all summer on this text. Um, but that was really this kind of save my own life text. And, it, and it's something that I finished and felt quite happy that I was able to get out of me, but put it in a drawer, you know, it was unreadable. It was so black and so um, dense and, and, and just intolerable, I think for anybody. But it wasn't written for that reason. And I only very, very slowly began to think maybe there's something that someone else could read. Um, I would say it took at least 10 years of, of, of this thing, mostly sitting in the drawer, but I would take it out every couple of years and, and, and rework it somehow. And what compelled me to do that, I really don't know, other than I felt like I hadn't really satisfied myself. So it, it went about a decade through various editions. Um, weirdly enough, my grandson asked me, you know, Grandpa, he said, do you, do you still have those? And I said, actually, yes, I still have all these, these editions, you know, that I, I would take it out, save the old one, copy it into a new file and go to work hacking and rewriting, you know. Anyway, late on, it began to, to dawn on me that maybe my own struggle might be helpful to someone else and um, certain parts of it. And then I began to realize, oh my God, that means writing it in a new style, new form, new tempo and rhythm and whatever sensibility. And I, I, I really, <laughs> it took another huge effort of multiple editions to begin to turn it into the animal it needed to be to make it tolerable to somebody else. But I, I, one of the reasons, the, one of the big reasons why I felt motivated to do it was I had become convinced that part of what the book is about, maybe in a certain sense, the most important thing that it's about is how we cope with death. How does anybody do it? How, and for good or for bad, my own desperate ploy was to actually not package it up. I mean, think about it for a second. We literally, our preferred mode of dealing with the dead is we bury them. Right. We dig a hole, we put them in, and we cover it over, yes, with a rock. Or we or think of how we say, we say, well, he's in heaven now. He's with God now. He's left us. He's, he's gone to a better place. We basically think the problem of mourning is the problem of letting go, which of course makes some sense. But my own grief was largely a matter of trying, first of all and foremost, to understand what happened. How could this have happened to this boy I love so much and who had so much promise, who was such a kind of magical person? Um, but I also began to feel like there's something I can learn from this. And I don't even know what that is, but I, there's something being, being you know, offered to me to, to, to teach me something here by this whole terrible series of events. And I've, I now feel that way. I'm now tempted almost to write something else, like a, 
a, a different book or a, an essay or something um, that talks about this question of really in the deepest and broadest sense, how do we deal with death? Um, how do we draw upon it as a resource? Is that even possible? Rather than trying simply to contain the damage, to kind of contain the radiation of, of mortality and, and death that usually losing somebody creates. Uh, so that's actually a big part of what the last um, few editions were about, is seeking something that would give other people a kind of touchstone about what a terrible loss feels like. But even more than that, how, how do we then kind of reconceive it in ways that may be actually su surprisingly nourishing and positive? Yeah, so I, it's, it strikes up. me. I'm really struck by what you just said. And from reading that, I've read the book a few times. And what struck me about what you said is that the way that we typically conceive of death as letting go, whereas yeah. I think the book- That's the best you can do. <laughs> right, right. But the, the memoir, it seems to me, says, actually, it's more about holding on to something, which is- not known, and I, 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 I'm reminded of the soliloquy in Hamlet, the undiscovered country from whose born no traveler has returned, right? Like, but, but in a sense, what you're suggesting, because we go back through your relation with him, and even with yourself, and there's, there's, a, there's this unknown within him that remains even after he dies. And I think that's, what's interesting is, that's what you're, you're, it seems to me like you're staying with, right? Like that's what's not being let go is this, is this, this unknown part of Oliver. And that, that's, that, that, what that then does is also rearranges or reorients your relation to the living as well, because it, it, it focuses on that part of them that's also unknown, right? And I know this has been a big part of how your thought has a direction, your thought has gone since since his death. And I, I, I wonder if that, that's what you are getting at by not letting go, but hold it, you know, holding on to something. Yeah, that is so right. I mean, you're precisely correct in just about everything you just said, both as a perception of the book and also of what I think it maybe most has to offer. Um, it's, it's also maybe important to, to point out that this whole thing about death as, a, as requiring the grieving mourning survivors to let go finally, as if that's the final kind of best we could get out of death. Um, one of the things that happened, which surprised me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get around to the unknowing thing, that this main theme of what you were just saying, but the, one of the things that surprised me about Oliver's death, he was 23. And so I, you know, I'd had plenty of time to really see him develop as a person. And he was a real live presence in an enormously important way in my life. What surprised me when he died is that I didn't feel like in a certain sense, I hadn't lost him. He was incredibly, almost disarmingly, vividly, hallucinogenically present at certain moments. Um, maybe, maybe because I had been deprived of him by the addiction and, and, and all the conflict and, and crisis that that produced for years. And suddenly in the sort of stillness after his death, he could kind of come back to me un, un sort of trammeled by all that heartache and, and danger and, and tragedy and all mess, you know, legal, medical, personal and otherwise. So that was the beginning of me kind of waking up to something and saying, wow, there's something here that it's coming back. He's coming back. But the culmination of that was this very paradoxical experience that I began to realize, of course I have these incredibly vivid memories of him that now revisit me, but it's almost like he personally comes back, very much including the dimension of him as a person that I never really knew. Like I, I, I would meet him kind of almost in, 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 in sort of fantasy or in weird memory. And I would, I would think, 
to myself, as I think many morning people do, I think, if only I could just ask him a few more questions. I suddenly have the questions now. I need to know and desperately would love to know. And so that experience led to what's now, as you know, the, the sort of last couple of chapters of the book, which deal with this question of how the dead leave us in a way with more questions, not just about how they died, but about who they were and what they meant to us. Um, and that strikes me now, having experienced this whole thing, it strikes me now as what I anticipate from people dying. I, I had a best friend die a year ago. Um, after a tremendous struggle with a liver transplant, he died um, after almost a year in, in this, in the, in, in this you know, ICU in New York. And his death also has visited me in this way. He comes back not as an, a complete enigma, but as interestingly and attractively presenting me with things, that, with, with questions about, you know, what would Paul say about this? And what was that about Paul? And it's kind of like I have him and have had him over the last year in a different way, as though he's not really gone. In a way, he's more present in death and in absence than he was when he was actually at the house for dinner. And I, I've become kind of fascinated by this. I mean, is this our proper relation to death? That it's really a kind of, yes, excruciating, but nevertheless important resource for us as we live on and, 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 and assimilate what we've lost and, and so on. So the book is, is very much about that. And you're right, I'm more and more, and more fascinated in general um, by that whole problematic of unknowing. The whole yeah, I mean, it makes me think of what, you know, dying parents say to their children, like, I'll always be with, you know, I'll always be with you. And I, I wonder if that's what they're saying. I, I don't know that they mean to say this, but what they're really saying is I'll always be with you as an absence, right? Like I'll always be this accompanying absence that you'll have with you. And I, it struck, it strikes me as that that's really like your, your book, the, the memoir is really so much about that, about how, and it, it's so tied, I think, to the unconscious too. So it's, I think it's really appropriate yes. that psychoanalysis is the, is it's, it's, it's not only the way you dealt with it, but it's also, I think, informs the trajectory of the, of the memoir. It's, it's almost like there's a, unveiling of the uncon of the unknowing in the unconscious and so i feel like that that there's almost a way that it, it the movement of it is from consciousness to the unconscious you know the trajectory of the of the memoir which which i so i don't know i mean you can comment on that and then i, I have another question but maybe you can just if you think uh, that's, that's right precisely correct and there are as you say there are both in the in the western judeo-christian tradition there are some um, hopeful and res resources in our ways of dealing with death um, where we understand it in this way, that it has something to, to give to us. Um, I often think that the dead parent who says, I'll always be with you, it really is mostly a matter of saying, my spirit will be looking out for you somehow, you know? Right. But the way the Greeks understood the spirit um, uh, of the departed, was like this, it seems, as far as I can see, that, that, that the departed does kind of continue to sort of communicate certain things, enable certain things. And of course, in Asia, it's much more common to have these kind of um, traditions of, of ancestor worship, of communicating and connecting with the people who are gone. And it, yeah, it strikes me that, that we, we really, I think would do well to, to cultivate that kind of openness. Um, however, <laughs> that can be really challenging. Um, and there've been a couple of, thank goodness, <laughs> a minority, a tiny minority of reviews, but there've been a couple of comments about the book that where people are obviously made, I think, quite uncomfortable by the book. Um, and I think this is a deep reason why, um, not only is new and different given our traditions, most of them, 
the general drift of them. But also, this is something that we haven't yet really done, I think, as a species very well, how to deal with the dead. Um, the dead who, in some important sense, aren't dead. Right. And I, that's not saying they're in heaven. That's saying they're in the unconscious. They're in our, they're in our souls. In yeah, a way it's that interesting that we, even Freud in Mourning and Melancholia, it's really about finally putting the dead to rest, right? Like it's not, I mean, exactly. I, I have the greatest, obviously, respect for Freud, but I think that in that, in that essay, which I think, I, this is my little pet argument. I think that is why it's the most popular thing that he ever wrote, because it's, the, it's, it's his point of betrayal of the psychoanalytic idea, because it's precisely about how can we put the dead to rest and, and move on with our life. Whereas I think the, the more important idea of the unconscious is really that that never happens and that there's some, that interaction with what's gone is really that's the crucial thing about what it means to be alive. So I think that that, that, I don't know, it seems to me like this is one area where in this one point, which maybe the most famous thing Freud wrote for other out, outside of people that are into psychoanalysis, that, 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 that that's a misstep on his part because precisely for the reason that you're, that you're saying. I completely agree. By the way, I never thought of it that way, but that you may be right that Morning and Melancholia is kind of the biggest takeaway text out of Freud's Yeah, it's the bestseller, right? Like it's the one that, like I have a, I have a friend who's teaching a class on, on introduction to critical theory and she's, she doesn't like psychoanalysis. She's like, oh, but I like Morning and Melancholia. So I'll teach that. And I'm like, of course you do. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But so, you're precisely correct. He literally, generally, but, but, but very really uses the metaphor of, uh, of, of, of cutting off the connections to the deceased, even to the point where we have to, in a certain sense, re-inventory all our objects and object by object, memory by memory, we need to detach. Right. It's literally a kind of metaphor of, 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 of a kind of not just letting go, but detaching. Yeah. As yeah, though I, that's the job. Yeah, and I, I think what's, what I love about your book and what it, the, what, the way it really impacted me, not just personally, but theoretically, was that it, it, it so cut against that and so made, I, this is, a, this is a, not a very uh, good way of putting it, but, but it, it made absence into a presence, right? Like it made yeah. this, this like having truck with what's gone as part of what it means to be really present. And I think that to me, that was the, 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 the best thing about that book. I want to touch on the, on the, what, what, one of the things that helped you get there. And I, th I found this pretty fascinating. So what you, you mentioned it, you mentioned this experience the first time we ever met, we were, <laughs> we were eating at a Mexican restaurant uh, in, in, in New Brunswick, New Jersey. And uh, the records. Yeah. 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 And, and yeah. you said, you brought up this, well, I did this psilocybin experiment. It really meant a lot to me. I'm like, I, well, you know, this guy's incredible. I think he's really smart. I don't know about this thing. <laughs> so uh, uh, but I, you know, I think it really, I think that, I think the book makes a really good case for what that, how that helps you on a kind of process of revelation of this very thing that we're talking about, right? So maybe you can talk about that and why you decided to include it in the, in the, in the memoir and, and then what role that it played in your own because clearly it's not part of the standard psychoanalytic practice <laughs> to undergo uh, the psilocybin experiment. Right, as you know, the, my analyst resisted the whole Resisted, idea. right, right. Um, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's really interesting. Um, I'll be brief, uh, uh, which may be a struggle because I am, as you know, quite fascinated by this whole um, business of uh, the, that psilocybin study, but also the, the, the effects of psychedelic materials on the brain. Um, from what crude understanding I have of the neuroscience of this, it's all really fascinating that that these psychedelic substances, as the as the neuroscientists call it, they sort of 
relax or, 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 or put out of play the default mode network of the brain, which is basically something like what Freud would call ego. So you, you, you kind of are invited or, or sometimes even cast out of your, you know, your, your familiar categories and understandings and touchstones of sanity and into something strange and maybe even threatening feeling, but something that you will, if you're open to it, potentially really grow from uh, a contact that is going to bring something else into your life that, of course, his, or back to the unconscious, has actually been in you in some sense. It's been there, but you've been fighting it off, um, maybe for just pure sanity. And um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm more and more, the fact that the memoir is is about a grief, but about a grief that is so importantly mediated by a psychoanalytic experience. Yes, is absolutely at the core of the whole thing. And I do, if anything, it's redoubled my fascination with, with this, what I think is the rich, real vein of what we should take with us into the future from the psychoanalytic discovery. Yeah, that's good. I, I wonder if we can talk just for a minute or two and I, this, this is, I don't mean to be like baldly political, but I, I it's an ethical question too. Uh, you mentioned, you spend a, I don't know, not a page, just less than a page about the gun, the availability of guns, right, in our society. And, and, and one of the things that I think gets not talked about nearly enough is that it's caused more than a mass shooting epidemic. Obviously that exists, but it's caused a suicide epidemic. I mean, the number of people that die by suicide is far outstrips the number of people that die by gun suicide is far outstrips the number of people die by mass shooting. It's not even close. Yep. Uh, so that, so that's, I mean, I wonder to what extent you think, like, if you want to talk about the role that that played in Oliver's death. And then the other question is, you know, you, you bring up this thing that is, it, it's so crushing that, you know, you had the sense that he might, actually be a mass shooter right yeah. and, and and he even talked he openly talked about it yes and then and then reporting that ended up screwing yeah. up his treatment so and also reporting it did absolutely no good at all because you can't, and, and really screwing up our relationship right uh, right there was a real but, but also slip. there was no positive benefit at all because they never take guns away from people no matter how bad their situation is no matter what they threaten. Uh, so that's, so I wonder if you could talk about that, that whole framework of the gun. And then my other question is, do you think killing himself was an ethical decision on Oliver's part because it didn't involve killing other people, killing Anna, killing other, other people, right? So yeah. I, I just, this just happened in a, a week ago, less. Our so our former next door neighbor, uh, his he killed, shot his ex girlfriend, and then shot himself. He, you've students here at the University of Vermont. He was a graduate. She was a student. So incredible, and wow. and, and and it just it happens all the time. And yeah. so I you know I think so one him not going and shooting a lot of people, and two not shooting. Anna and then shooting himself, which I think is, is, is probably as common as just suicide, right? So to what extent do you think that was on his part an ethical decision? Like, I just have to get out of this myself, but I'm not going to take anyone else with me. I wonder if you, have you thought about that at all? Or do you think that that just didn't even enter into it? Um, in an earlier version of this text, um, still in the very much in the time that it was mostly for the audience of one, namely me, uh, I included the quite lengthy eulogy that I wrote and, and delivered at his funeral. Um, and I finally took that out of it. Um, but one of the things that eulogy talked about very directly was how do we think about the fact that this boy shot himself to death? What is that? How, do, how are we going to assimilate that? What does it mean? How do I interpret that? And I ended up in the eulogy saying that my, you know, I will never know. But 
my inclination, my, my, my basic kind of gut response to that is yes, I think it was a, it was, it was a sacrificial act. It was, it was taking him, his own life rather than someone else's and that he, because he clearly, as you say, and as I recount briefly in the memoir, he was clearly uh, talking about becoming what we now dreadfully call a shooter. Right. He said to me at one point, Dad, I, I feel like going down to the mall and taking out as many people as I can before the police take me out. That right. was the exact quote. I remember it verbatim 16 years later. Yeah, and it's... it's um, I, I do, I do think that the gun epidemic is, a, is, is an incredible symptom of our moment. Would he um, have killed himself if, if he didn't have a gun, do you think? I don't know the answer to that one. I, I, he had made an attempts at, at cutting himself yeah. um, and he had taken pills. So he had made other attempts, but, but it's absolutely true. I, I don't think this is doubted by anybody who knows anything about the sort of epidemiology of, of suicide in the United States, that, that guns, you were saying this yourself a minute ago, that they make it so easy and by the way, I think that that, I'm, I'm also working on notes for, to write something about this too. Guns and the firing of guns is itself a really interesting phenomenon because, because it, it invites you into an absolute separation of the past and the future. In other words, it's a kind of absolute violent version of what, what, what Alan Badiou might call the event. It's evental in this absolutely punctual, violent way. And I, I seriously wonder whether the attraction of guns on the right, for instance, the, the sort of mania that, that, the, that the right in America has for gun um, liberty and all that, gun rights, has to do with this, I think. That, that, that guns have this kind of almost unique quality of altering reality in an absolute instant. So that guns in this sense are a total black and white, yes or no, all or nothing instrument, you know, metaphysically, you might have a say. Right. Well, they're um, also revolutionary, yes, aren't yes. they? I mean, it strikes me as even though it's the reactionary right that loves them, as you point out, they're all there. There is something maybe that maybe what you've uncovered is there's a kind of like revolutionary unconscious moment to the to the love for the gun because it does i think you're really right that there is this like absolute like it puts the past to bed and then creates and you know what struck me is the other the other apparatus that functions that way and in this case it was a it was you know largely a, a what would we call now a progressive apparatus the guillotine right like the guillotine yes. it's yeah. like it's like the Cooper A comes down and then that's, that's, that's it. Like, and then a new, yes. something new has started. So I think that, I think you're yeah. right. There is something to that, you know, the, the, it, it makes a before and after, right. With a, with an yeah. incredible violence. And I think that that, that really is what true. Lacan called the cut. Right, 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 right. Like the cut, exactly. right. Like not yeah. Yeah, event or cut. Yeah. I think that's right. Like rupture, something like that. I think that's really, I think that, it, 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 I think that really helps to explain its appeal, right? Like, I mean, I think, I think it's easier to say, oh, it's phallic and there's all this, but I think that that, I find that a little too facile. And I think that what you're saying is really makes a lot of sense to me that there's something, there is that like absolute break that gets made. And, and, and this is another reason, it's another way in which I'm trying to, to convey or to, to invite the reader into a zone where things are intrinsically complicated and messy and it's not possible to make a neat cut and the cut of course here the big cut is between life and death yeah that, that my son dead in a weird way is still here with me and in a certain other even weirder way he's more here than he was more potently present in his absence than he was when he was alive. Um, if I'm at all willing to acknowledge it, which is so the big question. In that um, sense, the gun is a lie, right? Because it, it, it yes. pretends 
to inaugurate a cut that doesn't really exist, right? That, that exactly, was, yeah. exactly, exactly. And you could also imagine that the that the shooter's primal motive is to institute that separating cut, which is a kind of ontological gesture, yeah. uh, existential slash ontological gesture of, of making a, some absolute separation. Um, and in a way, if I, if there's anything to my sense that we need to revamp our relationship with death and our dead loved ones, keeping them with us in some new way and really meditating with them and, 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 and interacting and remembering and reanimating them, it's refusing that cut. It's refusing the all or nothing of death and life, me and the other. Uh, it's, it's allowing that messy interpenetration of realities of persons. Yeah, it reminds me, let's, let's, I want to end with this question, but uh, so it reminds me of, of, of Hegel's like identity is the identity of identity and difference, right? And you said to yeah. me, when, it's interesting, I don't think his name appears in the, in the memoir unless I'm mistaken, but when you, you, when we talked about the psilocybin experiment at Johns Hopkins that you, you participated in, you said that I, it was the first time I really understood absolute knowing. Yes. And I think it's, I mean, what the way you describe the relation to, it's interesting that this is the first, you've mentioned the dead and that, but this is the first time you've said the other. And I think that's really crucial, right? Like that, 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 that absence in the, uh, that that's really how you relate to the other. And that, 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 that recognizing that my identity can't be separated from that, what I find in the other. Right. And I think, so I, I don't know if you feel like that, that's something that you came through to, you came to through the, the grieving process for Oliver in all these different dimensions, the psychoanalysis, the psilocybin experiment, the writing of the, of the memoir, is that, would you say that's true? It's absolutely, <laughs> absolutely uh, right to say that. And both the psilocybin experience, but also um, Oliver's death, the psilocybin experience being part of a year later, trying to sort of deal with his death. Yeah, I would say among other things, maybe the prime thing that it let me understand was, was that famous enigmatic quote from the preface to Hegel's Phenomenology, where he says, the life of spirit is given its, I'm murdering the quote here, but li the life of spirit is given its animation precisely by the negative, by destruction, by death. Um, I never really understood that. Um, and I think, both, isn't the word in German, absoluta serissenheit, like absolutely torn yeah, asunder, right? Exactly, like I think, exactly. Yeah. Absolute, be, absolutely being torn to pieces. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Yeah, thanks so much, Rick. I, I really, it was a great joy to talk to you. And I, I really, I can't recommend enough uh, Blown Away. I think Jameson Webster wrote a, a little review when she said, I know it's corny to say it, but I was really blown away by Blown Away. And I have to say, that's totally true for me too. So, so thanks for talking with me. Thank you for uh, doing the interview. It's been great for me too. Your questions have been really terrific.